started talking about the Goa Inquisition and Goan history, I got a lot of queries from well-meaning people from Goa and outside of Goa asking me why am I talking about the horrors of the past after so many years. Gade murde kyun ukhaad rahe ho was the question that I was asked very frequently. But the point is, unless you come to terms with the horrors of the past, unless you are aware of what happened to you, to your ancestors, unless you own your stories, you will always be mentally colonized. You will always be under the power of someone else, which is why it's very important to understand your own history and understand the history of your ancestors and to know more about the sacrifices that they made so that we can have the freedom that we take it for granted. Our problem is we have things far too easy. And I'm not just talking about my generation, but even the generation that came before me and the generation that came after me. We take freedom for granted. We have the freedom to wear the clothes of our choice, to go and eat at the places of our choice, to travel to the places of our choice. And we never realize what it is to live under a repressive uh, colonial regime. We have never had our freedoms compromised. We have never had anyone tell you that you can't do this or you can't worship your gods or you can't wear a particular dress or you can't pray or you can't have a tulsi plant in your house. So we don't know what it is like. We have never had to move to another place in the middle of the night in small boats just because we want to keep to our dharma, just because we love our dev, desh and dharma. And that's why there are no stories, there are no documented stories of the people who hopped onto small boats in the dead of the night and sailed into the unknown from Goa because the Portuguese had given them the choice that if you want to stay in the Portuguese controlled territories, you either get converted to Christianity or you leave or you get killed. They left not knowing whether they were going to remain alive, whether they were they were going to be buried at sea, what was going to happen to them, what are the lands that they're going to visit, what is going to happen to them in the future. They knew nothing. All they had in their heart was their steadfast de dedication to dharma. So they got into small boats and they left Goa. And they sailed all the way to the furthest tip of the western coast of India. They went all the way to Kochi. Some of them stayed in Mangalore, some of them stayed in Basrur, some of them stayed in the Karnataka coast. And that community, the Goan Konkani community, thrived there. But they never forgot the ties, the ancestral ties they had with their land, the land of their ancestors, the land of their gods. That is why many of them have the temples of their family deities in Goa. And at least once a year, they come and they do seva at these temples. But not enough has been documented about their struggles. What it was like in that era, in the 16th century, to land on an alien shore where you don't know the language, where you don't know the people, where uh, you, you have left your extended family behind, you're probably you know, all alone by yourself and you're trying to establish there. It is a story of a forced displacement that has largely gone ignored. And even today, we don't know enough about it to talk about it. The people who keep advising me to let bygones be bygones and to not talk about our past and to not let even the facts of history be known, I have only one answer to them. Why do you think the state of Israel, even today, ensures that the children born in the state of Israel know about the horrors of the Holocaust? Why do they make sure that their history is never forgotten? Why have they revived Hebrew? That is because they want to ensure that such a horror of Holocaust never happens again. And that is the reason why we must know the history of our ancestors, why we must know the truth and not simply say, okay, oh, uh, today everything is fine. So, you know, let's just forget about the horrors of the past. It is the horrors of the past that has made us who we are today. It is our past, it is our stories that has given us this sense of identity. And which is why it's very, very essential to know the story of our ancestors, to know the story of the Goa liberation movement. Why was Goa colonized for almost 450 years? That's a question all of us must ask ourselves. What made a small European nation like Portugal, which has a population probably less than a municipality in uh, India today, come all the way here and colonize us for 450 years. 
now there are different colonizing forces now you don't have people who come and overtly uh, try to convert you or try to destroy your culture now there are covert forces but the aim remains the same colonizers come in different guises today and it's important as for us to know how we were colonized once so that we are aware of the effects of colonization and we are aware of the effects of what has been done to us today i'm going to give you a general overview of the goa liberation movement not many people know that the that the portuguese were the first white colonial power to occupy a part of india in 1510 and they remained in india all the way through 1961 when they were officially kicked out by the military action of india 450 years is a really long time it's covered several generation it's four centuries and a lot can happen in four centuries it is to the credit of our ancestors that through 450 years most of them held on to their dharma most of them held on to their culture and they never let go of the ties they had with their motherland which is india a couple of years ago i had gone to peru and I, while i was uh, looking at the ruins of the incan culture there and uh, to see what peru has become today their history is very similar to ours what the portuguese did to goa the spanish did to peru they destroyed the local culture they destroyed the local language they destroyed the local religion and they converted the people en masse but what is the difference between goa and peru is that the entire peru capitulated to the spanish in a span of just less than 50 years whereas even after 450 years majority of the goans did not capitulate to the portuguese they held on to their dharma they held on to their beliefs they held on to their culture and they held on to the ties that they had with their motherland uh, today when people come to goa they only see beautiful beaches they only see churches they only see colorful houses and they think of goa as a land full of fun and fanny and that's a impression that has been consciously given even by the government of goa all the tourism brochures that you see will discuss goa and will describe goa as a land of fun and fanny it's a land that you come to do merry making it's a culture that's full of happy go lucky people which is all true in a way but goa also hides a very tragic past this is my tribute to my family who suffered greatly at the hand of lands of the repressive portuguese for over three generations my father shri prabakar vaidya who was a revolutionary fighter and one of the key uh, fighters of the azad gomantak dal my grandfather trivikram vaidya who was the person who drove ram manohar lohia to that momentous meeting on 18 june 1946 to loya maidan which basically sparked off the final phase of the goa liberation movement and my grandfather's brother venkatesh vishnu pai vaidya who was uh, uh, one of the first satyagrahis in south goa and he was arrested for it and he spent 6 months in agwa jail for it this is my uh, payment of my debt to them and this is a brief overview of what goa faced in the 450 years of occupation under the oppressive portuguese Goa Gomantak Apranta is a holy land it's a land of lord parshuram legend says that before parshuram arrived on the konkan coast goa was just water he shot off an arrow into the sea and he reclaimed the land and then he got families from the north to settle down in goa and that is how goa gomantak or apranta was created it is a holy land it is a land that was ruled by many 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 uh, rulers including the bhojas the shilaharas the kadambas the mauryas even then the bahmani sultans then the vijayanagar kings and finally the portuguese but the portuguese in the 450 years of their oppressive occupation tried to change the culture of goa the identity of goa and they tried to destroy it completely on november 25th 1510 Alfonso de Albuquerque invaded the city of Old Goa and a terrible slaughter of men women and children followed at that point of time the city of Old Goa was under the leadership of Adil Khan uh, one of the soldiers one of the one of the generals of Adil Shah and Albuquerque himself boasted about this in his letter to the king of Portugal in the following words he says and i quote i then burnt the city and put everything to sword we counted 6000 dead bodies it was a great deed my lord 
And those 6,000 dead bodies belong not just to soldiers, but they belong to civilians as well. And they included men, women, and children. And that is how Alphonse de Albuquerque occupied the city of Goa. And that's how the Portuguese gained the first foothold in Goa. Within a week of his conquest of old Goa, Albuquerque had already started the construction of the Church of St. Catherine. The Portuguese also opened a slave market in Goa. Slavery was largely unknown to Goa. And in the slave market, the men, women and children from the surrounding areas were smuggled in and sold as slaves and sent off to distant land. Nobody knows what happened to them. Nobody knows how many people, how many living beings were sold in the slave market and what happened to them because there is no documentation. The Portuguese ensured that in 1540, by the order of the King of Portugal, all Hindu temples in the city of Old Goa and the island of Tivar were demolished. In 1542, Francis Xavier arrived in Goa and started active proselytization. When he felt that the people he had converted, the neo christians were still not taking to their new religion and they were still reverting to their old ways of worship, he wrote a letter to the king of Portugal saying that these people keep going back to their old ways, so we need a court of inquisition to be established in Goa. And he kept making this request. It is true that when the court of inquisition was finally established in Goa, he was not alive. He had moved to Malacca then and he had died there. But we cannot forget the fact that he was the one who played a very active role in proselytizing the people of Goa. And he has gone on record in his own words when he has written in his letters saying that he encouraged the people he converted to destroy the temples of the gods they once worshipped. And he got great pleasure in doing so. In 1561, the court of inquisition was established in Goa. In 1560, the same year with the Court of Inquisition arrived in Goa, more than 13,000 people were forcibly converted to Christianity. In 1559, Hindus were legally prohibited from holding public office in the areas under Portuguese control. And they were given three choices, as I said earlier, that they could convert, they could leave, or they could get killed. <laughs> These are the exact same choices that the Kashmiri Hindus were given in the 1990s History does repeat itself, and this is the reason why we need to know more about history. In 1567, Diego Rodriguez, captain of Rachel Fort, destroyed 280 temples within a span of few months in Salset alone. Not a single temple, big or small, was spared. Last week when I went to Goa, I visited the site of uh, the original uh, temple of Sri Shantadurga in a place uh, near, near Lotli. Rasai, it's called. There is a huge banyan tree which is probably more than 400 years old. And under that, there is a small plaque which was erected at the place uh, on the 400th anniversary of the demolition of the temple. Somebody comes and lights a lamp there. There is a murti, there is a, there is a photograph of the goddess, and somebody puts flowers there. And it's a very somber, sad place. It's, it's very oppressive. When you go there, you have this overwhelming feeling of sadness. And I think every one of us, every Hindu, whether it's Goan, or Goan Christian or Goan Hindu, or even every Indian should go to this place when you come to Goa, when you're done with your beach merrymaking, please take some time to visit this place to understand what is the searing pain of displacement. In uh, Salsit alone, in 1578, Paulist missionaries converted more than 100,000 people of the coastal area to Christianity. Those who didn't want to get converted had to leave their homes in a mass exodus. Many undertook a perilous journey by boats and landed on the west coast as far as Kochi. You see that community now, it's thriving because they are hardworking and they established themselves in alien lands. But when they went from Goa, they had nothing. They had no land. They had no identity. They had no family uh, bonds of kinship. All they had was a dedication to their dharma and probably a little bit of gold. But they still managed to make a success of themselves. And that is a proof of their industriousness. Goan nationalist T.B. Kuna has written that the Hindus who welcomed the Portuguese to inflict revenge on the Mohammedans found that the god of Christians was much more ferocious than that of the Mohammedans. And it is true that some Hindus belonging to the court of some kings in Honavar had actually invited Alphonse de Albuquerque, thinking that he will come to Goa, he will defeat the Adil Shahi forces, and after that they'll pay him some monetary tribute, and then he'll go back. 
they never uh, anticipated that the portuguese would colonize them for 450 years and that is the history that keeps repeating in india over and over again that we trust somebody else to save us and then the savior turns into the oppressor but many people ask me that if the portuguese were this repressive tyrannical and evil that they destroyed culture they destroyed temples they destroyed a way of life they tortured goans why did the goan people not resist why was there not a substantial mass movement for the liberation of goa they ask this question because the truth has been hidden from them and many people are not even aware of this distinct history of goa and the history of the people who resisted the portuguese occupation all through right from the 16th century the fights were sporadic yes they were not united yes they were probably not a whole mass movement encompassing the whole of goa yes but it is erroneous and uh, it is it is uh, distorting history to say that the goans never resisted the portuguese my village my ancestral village konkolim was one of the first places to fight against a white colonial power right from the middle of the 16th century to the beginning of the 20th century there were no less than 40 revolts in different places done by different people in goa against the portuguese which were suppressed with complete brutality and violence by the portuguese starting in 1575 people of my village kunkolim and four other neighboring villages asolna velni veroda and ambeli revolted against the oppressive portuguese regime at first they peacefully protested and they said that we will not pay any taxes to this regime which doesn't respect our culture and our religion if you destroy our temples we are not going to pay you any money this was the first non cooperation movement or asarkar andolan practiced anywhere in the world not just in india long before gandhi ji ever thought of it when this didn't work and the portuguese brutally attacked them a number of times they came to the village they raided the village they destroyed the temples they burned the houses of the people the people simply escaped to the neighboring forests and then when the portuguese left they came back and they rebuilt their temples into makeshift structures and continued their worship this happened over the years from 1575 to 1583 and 1583 in the month of july something very very major happened when the local people realized that the portuguese forces are coming to convert them and to destroy the main temple in the village that is the temple of shanta durga which is there in a place called tuliyabhat in the center of the village they realized that that is how they are going to oppose it so what they did was when the portuguese priests the jesuit priests and uh, some converted goan christians and the portuguese forces had come to the village to convert the goan the kunkolim people and to destroy the temples people got together spontaneously and they attacked the entire portuguese party five jesuit priests were killed one portuguese soldier was killed and 15 others were killed by the villagers in a fierce battle this happened without any king leading them without any general leading them this was a people surprising against a brutal oppressive white colonial power this is probably the first example of its kind in the entire world where the entire people of a village rose as one against an oppressive alien uh, white colonial regime long before french revolution long before the ideas of liberty equality and fraternity uh, where you know uh, came into vogue the portuguese government retaliated by executing all the village chieftains involved in this uh, fight against the portuguese and they did it by deceit they called them for talks peace talks in the fort of asolna so you don't have to come armed and when they came unarmed they were given free passage they were promised free passage and when they entered the fort of asolna the doors of the fort were shut and they were brutally massacred only one of them survived because he jumped from a window to the neighboring river and he swam away to safety but the tales of the chieftains of kunkolim continue to inspire generations of goan today and every gaonkar or every native of kunkolim it doesn't matter what religion he or she practices today whether it's christianity or hinduism they are aware of this history and they are aware of the sacrifice of the chieftains after the chieftains were killed kunkolim was subjugated because there was no leadership and all the in- people from the village were forcibly converted their lands were taken over and they were given to portuguese uh, counts even today 
even even during liberation time many of the lands that originally belonged to the gramsans of konkolim were privately owned by the counts of portugal because of the result of this rebellion because of the result of this first fight for goan independence i refuse to call it a revolt the portuguese destroyed the complete economic and social structure of konkolim the gramasansta after this first war for goan independence and this uh, had ripples everywhere in goa when the people from the rest of goa knew about the brutal uh, brutal uh, brutal way the first war for goan independence was uh, put down they also started becoming a little scared but that didn't stop people from other places to fight against the portuguese in 1787 there was the conspiracy of the pintos of candoli a movement that was led by father caetano victoriano de faria in lisbon and father jose antonio gonçalves and father caetano francisco cuto in goa these were goan catholic priests who had earlier converted to christianity they had attended uh, the seminaries and they were training to be clergy but they were still treated as second class citizens by the jesuits and they were not given positions that they felt they deserved in the church administration and only because their skin was not white and because they were goan christians and they were not of portuguese descent so this rankled them so they Uh, revolted against the jesuits and revolted against the portuguese but they were betrayed betrayed by antonio jose toscano who reported their plans to the portuguese government the rebels there were 47 in total were imprisoned and the leaders were executed father faria however managed to escape capture and he found sanctuary in paris and the way they were executed the pintos the the people involved in this rebellion was really horrible they were publicly executed in the streets of lisbon and their bodies were chopped into pieces and they were paraded as a lesson for everybody else then the ranis of satari revolted against the portuguese no less than 20 times between 1755 and 1912 their biggest revolt was in 1924 and 1952 and kustova rani and dipaji rani are the names that go and stake with reverence even today before 1820 goa was a portuguese colony governed by an autocratic viceroy appointed by the portuguese king and he was answerable only to the portuguese king and the office of the inquisition was not even answerable to the portuguese king they were answerable only to the pope there was no political participation at all from the local population in 1822 though goa was made namesake a province of portugal and as such eligible goans were allowed to elect three representatives of the portuguese parliament but there was a catch there because the people who could vote these representatives those had to speak portuguese they had to be catholics and they had to pay substantial taxes so only less than 10% of the total people in goa could vote for namesake and they could elect so called representatives to the portuguese parliament this was also another hogwash in 1510 when the portuguese arrived in goa and in 1540 they started this tradition of active polit- uh, active religious persecution of the hindus and that ended in 1910 officially that official discrimination against hindus ended so from 1540 to 1910 there was an institutionalized policy of discrimination against hindus in the portuguese government policies this uh, repealing of this policy in 1910 it led to an outburst of intellectual cultural and political life in goa for the first time since the advent of the portuguese rule hindus could openly declare their ties to mother india this led to a renewal of nationalistic sentiments before this goans had managed to keep alive their ties with india by keeping alive marathi language in secret in goa the portuguese had ensured that konkani uh, speaking konkani was banned they had burnt konkani books they had burnt marathi books also but the goan people still got together and they started marathi schools in secret in their homes in the neighborhood temples and ensured that the children got connected to the motherland of india they were taught songs in marathi they were taught aartis in marathi they were taught uh, religious scriptures in secret because they couldn't do it openly they couldn't even do pujas like ganesh chaturthi puja openly that is why goan started this process this uh, this practice of worshiping ganesh ganpati as patrisa ganpati as ganpati painted on paper which could be hidden quietly 
and uh, if the portuguese came to check there would be no murtis visible anywhere hindus were uh, prohibited uh, from marrying in portuguese territories so they had to go either on the other side to territories controlled by the saundekars or by adil shah still to get married or to have any religious function and when people died they had to be cremated in a boat in the middle of uh, the rivers it was such a brutal and repressive regime but after 1910 there was a period of renaissance where the hindus of goa particularly started speaking more and more in favor of uh, joining india and against the portuguese government goan historian pampu shirodkar describes this intellectual and political renaissance in the following words with the turn of the 20th century while the movement for political liberties gathered momentum in india a silent revolution was taking place in the portuguese territories the people of goa were evincing a keen interest in the liberation struggle in the mainland and trying to identify themselves with the indians the growing liberation struggle inspired them to assert their rights and on the other hand the portuguese rulers resorted to rigorous repressive measures for suppressing the national awakening the small uh, window that was granted to the hindus of goa in 1910 was soon taken back when there was a regime change in portugal and antonio salazar an oppressive dictator came to power in portugal in a coup and with this regime change he uh, did an ordinance called carta organica and under that all civil liberties were taken away from the people of goa once again they were back to where they started under the very oppressive regime in all this what was the role of the church the goan church you might ask well the church strongly supported the pro colonial policies and the portuguese rule in goa the catholic church in goa and the, the chief of that the patriarch issued over 60 official letters to the priests in different dioceses telling the telling them to preach in their uh, in their weekly masses to their congregations that religious salvations of goan christians lay only with the portuguese and they had to dissociate themselves from the rest of india in order to gain religious salvation that it was a religious duty to support the portuguese rule despite that several highly educated goan christians like tb kuna and tristan de braganza became staunch nationalists and started uh, talking more and more about the systematic colonization of goan mindset by the portuguese and talked about what is the need to decolonize it on 18th june 1946 ram manohar loya lit the spark against the by then 435 year old portuguese rule in goa by his very famous speech in go in madgaon which is remembered till today and because of that 18 june is celebrated as the goa revolution day dr roya was arrested immediately and he was jailed in agwada and later he was forcibly deported to mainland india but his speech and subsequent arrest and the arrest of all the people who were there on the stage including my grandfather had started a revolution for the first time goa nationalists and indian freedom fighters joined hands even though goa congress was formed earlier in 1928 Goan started mass satyagrahas. Dr. Tristan de Braganza was the first satyagrahi of Goa, followed by Lakshmikant Bhimre, Dr. Hegde Desai, Venkatesh Vishnu Pai Vaidya, my grandfather's brother, and others. The movement continued up to November 1961. More than 1,500 people were arrested. The 1946 satyagraha continued intermittently till India was completely free. When India got freedom from the British in 1947 many Goan nationalists like Dr T B Kuna believed that once the British left India Portuguese will also leave Goa or what they called the Estado da India they are Estado da India because the French and Dutch had already prepared to leave and that transfer of power had happened more or less amicably so they thought, they thought that Portugal which was anyways by that time a uh, uh, not not a great power in Europe would leave on its own but salazar continued holding on to goa because he considered it as a prestige point and he considered that uh, the portuguese had a divine god given church given right to rule goa and daman and div which which constituted the estados de goa the indian nationalists described the portuguese colony of goa then after 1947 when india became independent as an ugly pimple on the face of mother india it took at the period from 1947 to 1961 for this pimple on the on the face of mother india to finally go 
and even then it had to be surgically excised in 1949 nehru's government established a legation in lisbon to negotiate with the portuguese government their withdrawal from goa to nehru's surprise however the portuguese government refused to even discuss the issue in 1953 a goa action committee was formed under the leadership of tb kuna which sort of served as a central committee which would oversee all sorts of uh, movements for goa's liberation and subsequent integration with india including the satyagraha including the armed revolutionary movements the many streams of nationalist thought that were in work in goa at that point of time the portuguese forces came down heavily upon the satyagrahis arresting them indiscriminately torturing the arrested prisoners and even shooting at the unarmed satyagrahis this led to an increasing realization among the young people of goa that the tyrannical portuguese were not on the same league as the british and they cannot be fought with passive resistance movements but you need to have an armed struggle to strike a blow against the portuguese particularly against the repressive policies of the salazar thus began a new chapter in goa's history the chapter that was dominated by an organization called the azad gomantak dal my father uh, spent almost a decade of his life fighting for azad gomantak dal and i have heard stories of how much my entire family sacrificed for it uh, so that he could go and fight because in those days there were no way of communication he was mostly underground and his family his parents would never see him maybe once in a while in 6 months he would come for a couple of hours and then leave because he was always on the run from the portuguese he was on the most wanted list of the portuguese and when he came uh, my grandmother i heard stories that my grandmother would touch him and ensure that he had no bullet wounds or that he was not bleeding anywhere such was the terror of the portuguese azad gomantak dal was inspired and named after netaji subhash chandra bose's azad hind sena and it was a revolutionary group that vowed to fight the portuguese using armed struggle as the means it was founded by a young goan vishwanath lavande who was initially a gandian and who had even participated in the satyagraha after he was inspired by loya but he realized very quickly from the way the portuguese had come down heavily upon the satyagrahis that satyagraha is not the way to uh, to fight the portuguese and he was very influenced by the by the thoughts of swatantra veer savarkar and by the basic thought that rana veena swatantra kona mehale meaning who has won freedom without an armed fight azad gomantak dal had people like vishwanath lavande narayan hari naik tatatri desh pande mohan ranade and prabhakar sinari as its leaders and the dal carried out a series of attacks on portuguese police stations and banks After the first attacks the dal sainiks were caught by the portuguese were sentenced to almost 30 years of imprisonment in exile outside of goa either in portugal mainland portugal or in the african colonies of portugal like angola by the portuguese courts narayan naik and dattatreya deshpande suffered about 14 years of imprisonment in prisons of portugal and angola however they were released after the liberation of goa Vishwanath another person Mohan Ranade was in the Portuguese jails for many years even after Goa became liberated and it took long concerted efforts to get him free however the leaders of the Azad Gomantak Dal Vishwanath Lavande and Prabhakar Sinari managed to escape being arrested and continued their armed struggle against the Portuguese rule by forming huge armed force of anti colonial fighters with their headquarters in Goa India borders at two places at wazre in north goa and at mazali in south goa my father prabhakar vaidya joined them by dropping out of wadia college he was studying at wadia college in pune at point, that point of time and he joined in directly in the middle of the night he took a train to bombay and went and joined azad gomantak dal in the liberation struggle of dadra nagar haveli rss was also a part of this struggle and they led a joint attack on dadra nagar haveli on 28 july 1954 and liberated it on 2nd of august After that Azad Gomantak Dal came Azad Gomantak Dal and their fighters they came back to mainland Goa and they continued their struggle against the Portuguese all the way through 1961 they successfully carried out raids on police stations and factories they ambushed military patrols they attacked troops stationed at the border and blew up ammunition dumps and railway bridges on the lucrative mining routes to ensure that the economic power of the Portuguese rule in Goa was uh, curtailed they even attempted assassinations of important portuguese officials azad gomantak dal ran its own radio station 
it had its arms training arms and explosive training camps and it published a newspaper azad kumantak dal was not a rat tag bunch of outlaws it is a well formed organization it had a clear printed manifesto it had membership rules and it had a plan of action clearly outlined for a free goa that included agrarian reforms that included economic reforms that included cultural reforms the south goa unit of azad gomantak dal and the north goa unit of azad gomantak dal carried out several daring attacks on the portuguese armories and even military outpost including the armory of konkolim and the military outpost of bali these attacks were carried out under the leadership of my father prabhakar vaidya however in response to the group's revolutionary tactics the portuguese increased their military presence by bringing in white and african troops from their colonies elsewhere these troops were known in goa as pakle and kapris respectively and they struck terror in the hearts of goans because these were mercenaries who were very very brutal and repressive many dal sainiks like rajnikanth kinkre rudana sardesai were brutally murdered by these soldiers however the azad gomantak dal continued to fight all the way through 1961 meanwhile a parallel movement was going on of satyagraha in which increasingly more and more people from mainland india were taking part in it mostly people from karnataka and maharashtra on 15th of august 1954 hundreds of indians mostly from maharashtra crossed the portuguese goan borders defying a ban by both the indian government as well as by the portuguese go and portuguese government and they participated in a satyagraha the portuguese responded to this by shooting indiscriminately at the satyagrahis and many were injured and killed the portuguese response to the satyagrahas which continued throughout 1955 was sealing goa's borders in an attempt to curb the growing illegal immigration from india by 1955 the indian government had finally developed a policy on the portuguese goan territory which supported the integration of goa with india nehru could have done this many many years ago because goa was a really small place with a small force of portuguese soldiers but he tried diplomacy to the cost of the goan people's aspirations to the cost of what the goan people suffered probably because he wanted to be called shanti dut i don't know between 1955 and 1961 six political parties were formed in 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 goa to advocate for an end, end to portuguese colonial rule these parties included the azad gomantak dal the rankor patriota the united front of goans goans people party goa liberation army and quit goa organization and all these people they worked independently but the resistance to the portuguese in goa rule in goa was increasing and it was all sorts of resistance there were satyagrahas there were shouting of jai hind slogans the general population was getting more and more restive and there are some people who will tell you that the resistance was only from the hindu population of goa and the christians of goa was largely supportive of the portugal rule they are telling you a lie because even though the portuguese the goan elite yes they were supportive of the portuguese rule because they were the beneficiaries of that rule they were they spoke portuguese at home they occupied plum positions in the portuguese uh, government so a small section of the 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 goan uh, christian elite did support the portuguese rule but the average goan christian who was working class they were equally fed up of the repressive policies of the portugal rule portuguese rule as much as the goan hindus and they fought against the portuguese to the nail azad gomantak dal had many um, had a majority of hindu volunteers yes but they also had christian volunteers who participated equally one of the greatest nationalist thinkers from goa was shri tb kunya and his brother in law uh, his minas braganza in 1961 india finally proclaimed that goa should join india either with full peace or with full use of force after the failure of diplomacy with the portuguese government of goa finally ordered the indian armed forces to take goa by force in a military operation that lasted just for 2 days on 18th and 19th december 1961 titled operation vijay indian troops captured goa and they liberated it and integrated it in india with little resistance from the portuguese forces then in goa the governor general of then portuguese go, uh, goa vasalu silva signed an instrument of surrender he was the 128th 
and the last governor general of Portuguese Goa, 128. Can you imagine the span of years for, that it takes for 128 people to rule Goa from distant Portugal? He disobeyed direct orders from Salazar to fight until death and to follow a scorched earth policy. And because of that, he uh, he surrendered quickly, sensing that resistance was futile. But because of that, he was court-martialed in Portugal and he was ostracized and uh, he, he, was, uh, he was treated as a traitor for failing to follow orders. He was expelled from the military and was sent into exile. His rank and freedom were restored only in 1974 after the fall of the Salazar regime. This, in short, is the story of Goa's liberation movement that effectively started in the second half of the 16th century all the way and lasted all the way till Goa was liberated on 19 December 1961 and became an integral part of Mother India. As they say in an African proverb, that till the lions tell their own history, the history will be always written by the hunters. Thank you.